many of the world's bishops are calling out the German synodal path. And Pope Francis makes headlines in an interview accusing journalists of wallowing in scandal. The National Catholic Registrar's Ed Penton and editor of Catholic World News, Philip Lawler, are here with analysis. And TV producer and author Roma Downey joins us to talk about her brand new book, Unexpected Blessings. And communist authorities continue to tighten their grip on religious liberty in China. In an exclusive, one Chinese cleric is speaking out. Priest of the Diocese of Hong Kong, Father Vincent Wu, and director of the Center for Religious Freedom, Nina Shea, will tell us what we aren't hearing in the wider media. Finally, what could be the humanitarian cost of China's COVID lockdown in Shanghai and the economic toll? President of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosher, is here to weigh in. A can't miss world over begins right now. Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An inspiring and very important show for you tonight. Stay with us. This is information you're not going to hear anywhere else. If you'd like to comment on the show, tweet me. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover this evening. Let's begin. Over 70 bishops from around the world recently signed a fraternal open letter to the German episcopate expressing concern over Germany's controversial synodal path and warning that the heterodox German reform efforts risk fracturing church unity. Here with analysis of this and much more, editor of Catholic World News and visiting fellow at Thomas More College, Philip Lawler, and the National Catholic Register's Vatican correspondent, Edward Penton, reporting from Rome. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start with the list of signatories to this letter. Uh, it's grown to over 90 now. It includes four red hats, Nigerian Cardinal uh, Francis Arinze, uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, uh, South African Cardinal Wilfred uh, Napier, and Australian Cardinal George Pell. Now, the letter expresses several concerns with this German synodal path, including undermining the credibility of church teaching and authority, drawing inspiration primarily from sociological analysis and political ideology, replacing a Christian notion of freedom with autonomy, lacking the joy of the gospel, and a focus on power that suggests a spirit fundamentally at odds with the real nature of Christian life, um, undermining the idea of synodality, thus further impeding the church's necessary conversation about fulfilling the mission of converting and sanctifying the world. That's a mouthful. Phil, uh, what do you make of this letter? The bishops are clearly concerned that what's happening in the German synod will spill over into other countries. Is this letter a warning to perhaps uh, the bishops who look to use the papal synod on synodality to push similar charges and that those proposed changes might not be tolerated? Well, it's certainly a warning, a warning particularly to the German bishops, but to other bishops as well, including the bishops in their own countries, the countries, I mean, of the signatories, most of whom are American, by the way. And it's mm -hmm. a warning, I think, to the bishops of the world that if we go into this synod on synodality and there's a move for the same sort of radical change in church doctrine and discipline, that there will be resistance, that there will be an argument. It's a, to my mind, it's a tremendously positive development that we're having this argument out in the open rather than trying to camouflage what are obviously deep divisions that could become much deeper if, mm -hmm. if there isn't that sort of resistance. Ed, how was this letter received in Rome? And do you see this, do the people in Rome see this as an effort to get the Pope to weigh in on this German synod and what's happening there? I think that's right, Raymond. Yes, I think the, the reaction has been generally positive to this letter. I think some people thought, that why is it taking so long? Uh, of course, the, this synodal mm -hmm. process has been going on for some time now. <clears throat> and I think uh, this, this lot, some people think this is rather overdue. Um, but at, at any rate, they're, they're, I think quite a few people are happy about this. 
Um, and uh, yes, I think it does show also that the Holy Father has um, it, to draw it to his attention. Of course, he knows about it already. Uh, but it, again, mm -hmm. this is a third a major letter from from bishops, the other two being the Nordic bishops and the Polish bishops. Right. Um, and so this will certainly uh, be uh, very much uh, in his entree, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed and Phil, uh, very quickly, uh, in the in a response to all of this, Bishop uh, Georg Batzing, who's the uh, head of the German Catholic Bishops Conference, he said he'd like to counter any concerns that the Germans are trying to neglect, you know, the community of faith here, and tried to poo-poo it all. Uh, does that wash, Ed? Um, I don't think so. And I think he's given pretty much the same sort of boilerplate response to, to each of these mm -hmm. letters. And he's saying, well, this is because of the abuse crisis. We had to act. We need to—the Pope expressly asked us to act boldly, and so that's what we've done. Uh, but it, it's not really washing, of course, with, with the bishops who've signed these letters, uh, because that's—it it kind of skates over the real problems, which are the fact that um, they feel that the, these, the synodal path is not scripturally based and it's not in accordance with tradition. Hmm. Uh, Phil, earlier this month, Sister Nathalie Bekar, uh, <clears> the <throat> undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops, the general secretariat, responsible for coordinating all the Vatican synods, uh, she delivered an online PowerPoint presentation to New Ways Ministry. Now, this is an organization which promotes gay and transgender rights in the church. Uh, the subject of the presentation was synodality, a path to reconciliation. Now, bear in mind, New, New Ways Ministry was disciplined by the Vatican in the 1990s because of flaws in their approach to ministry. However, in December, Pope Francis praised Sister Janine Gramic's work. She's one of the founders. Phil, what do you make of this? And does it tell us anything about the direction of the current Bishop Synod on synodality? It certainly tells us a great deal about the direction of the general secretariat of the Synod. They have been anxious uh, to cooperate with New Ways Ministry and with other similar organizations. Uh, and they're sending mixed messages, which I'm afraid are the hallmark of this pontificate. Uh, the mixed message being, here's an organization that has been uh, subject to uh, scrutiny by the Vatican, subject to a caution by the Vatican, uh, because it was inaccurately portraying the teachings of the Church, uh, and yet the Vatican is anxious to work with this organization. So, it, as I say, it's the hallmark of this pontificate is the mixed messages, the confusion, the outreach to people uh, who are, in fact, undermining the, the teaching of the Church, and this in the guise of synodality, uh, so that it really adds to the tension that a lot of us are feeling that this synod on synodality is going to be an exercise in the, fomenting the same sort of confusion. Mm. Ed, in the register, you reported that Cardinal Raymond Burke, the prefect emeritus of the Apostolic Signatura, said of New Way's ministry in this presentation, it is not proper that a member of the Synod of Bishops representing this high-level consultative body in the Church speak to an organization which is in dissent from the Church's teaching on the homosexual condition, on homosexual acts, and to express the idea that somehow the Church can be reconciled with these positions which are contrary to her teaching. Ed, how is Sister Bekar's presentation to New Ways Ministry playing in Rome and among the bishops who may or may not be participating here? Well, I think some some welcomed it. They thought it was uh, part of the synodal process, so they, they thought it was quite a right for this sort of exchange to happen. Of course, others were not so happy. And uh, um, Ricardo Cascioli, interesting, the editor of the New Daily Compass, said that it was um, uh, really uh, just emblematic, really, of this tribe, this attempt to to try to legitimize the sort of LGBT agenda, because why don't they um, give lectures to to those uh, organizations like Courage, for example, which are faithful to the church's teaching? Mm -hmm. Why not give a lecture to them? And so he's saying it, it just it's, it's extremely disruptive, and um, because this group, is, as you say, is dissenting. So, so there is that. But I think one of the interesting things about this speech was the emphasis that Sister Natalie placed on the youth synod and also the um, the emphasis that, that, that the spokesman for the synodal bishops, synodal bishops um, 
Thierry Bonaventura also said uh, to me in that article, uh, also stressing the Youth Synod. And the Youth Synod seems to have been deliberately uh, sort of organized to have this sort of platform for the homosexual agenda to, to become part of the synodal discussions. They both refer to the final report of that synod um, and the, the reference to homosexuality in there. And they've used it uh, precisely uh, again, uh, quite openly, uh, to push this this agenda at this at this stage of the uh, of the synod on synodality. Hmm. Phil, I want to switch gears slightly here and uh, report on a letter that Pope Francis wrote to an Argentinian journalist. This was on April seventh, in which he accuses journalists who speculate that he has supported Russian President Vladimir Putin of having a feces fetish. He writes, quote, always in that information are some of the sins that journalists tend to fall into, disinformation, slander, defamation, coprophilia. I'm told some article authors get paid for this. Sad. A vocation as noble as communicating soiled in this way. Um, the Vatican so far has not commented on the Pope's letter. Uh, Phil, uh, and this is not the first time the Pope has made this kind of comparison. In 2016, he made a similar comparison in a Belgian communication. Uh, but your reaction to this, Phil? Well, it's sad, really. It's uh, another example of the Pope being, frankly, nasty. I mean, that's not the sort of language that you would expect of a Roman pontiff. And it's just, it's very disappointing. It's disheartening uh, that we can't have at least an elevated sort of dialogue if we're going to have dialogue from the Vatican, from the Holy Father. It's, mm -hmm. what can I say? It's, it's not the sort of, it's not edifying. It's, it's not in, in accordance with his position. It degrades his authority. It's just very unfortunate. Yeah, I, I won't. I won't uh, unpack the the real meaning of that word. I'm being nice, calling it a fecal fetish. Um, Ed, during an interview on Good Friday last week, Pope Francis uh, awkwardly sat silent when a reporter said, "Quote: It's nearly three o'clock. How are we to live this hour today?" Pope Francis does not respond. He remains silent. He looks down, and then awkwardly, there's this long pause. Um, what have you heard to explain this silence? There is an explanation. Yes, I mean, that went uh, quite viral. A lot of, uh, a lot yes, of people picked up on it, especially here in, in Italy. Um, and I think, the, it, taken out of context, it did, it did look rather strange. I mean, he sat there for, for a full minute, uh, just, just in silence. Um, and uh, but but I think it was it, the context, of course, was Good Friday and and three o'clock being the the time of Christ's uh, death on the cross, and so and that hour, and so he was really um, I think reflecting on the, the the suffering and the meaning of the crucifixion during that time. But I think it uh, I think without seeing that context, it did, it did seem rather strange. And um, yeah, but, on but, TV but it was odd. Weird. But I get the. Yeah, I get the point. That he was he was he was meditating on the passion and taking a moment. Well, he also said um, just before, beforehand. He just said uh, the best response to Good Friday is silence. And then and then she asked him that question: How should we I spend see. this hour uh, for, in Good Friday on Good Friday? Yeah. So then he yeah, and and taken out of context, it did look a little you know bizarre on TV. But I'm glad you explained it. Uh, as Russian aggression worsens in the Ukraine. Patriarch Kirill, head of the Russian Orthodox Church, continues to support the war in Ukraine. In an open appeal last week, more than 320 Orthodox priests in Ukraine accused the Patriarch of Moscow of preaching heresy. And they've asked the global church leaders to bring him before a tribunal to decide whether he should be deposed. They write, quote, Kirill committed moral crimes by blessing the war against Ukraine and fully supporting the aggressive actions of Russian troops on Ukrainian territory. It is impossible for us to remain in any form of canonical submission to the Patriarch of Moscow. Um, Ed, I'm going to start with you, then, Phil. Pope Francis has met virtually with Kirill since the start of this Russian aggression. Uh, he's been very strong on the use of Russia, uh, r religion rather, by the Russians to justify this kind of violence. Obviously, Kirill doesn't care all that much. Uh, is there frustration at the Vatican about Moscow's continued invocation of religion to explain this aggressive behavior? 
I think there is, Raymond, yes. And of course, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis and his predecessors have often said that, you know, we mu the, the, you cannot use uh, religion to justify war. And, and this is, seems to be very much along those lines. And, uh, but the Pope is, is sort of playing a rather a, a, tight, a tightrope here because he wants to keep good relations with Patriarch Kirill. They had a, mm -hmm. a, a very possible meeting lined up later this year before the conflict began before the war began in Iraq, in uh, Ukraine. And I think they, they want to, to keep that at least uh, ticking along and possible. And I think, um, so he's, he's playing it rather carefully. Uh, but at the same time, I think people are, are generally quite pleased with how he has handled this, that he hasn't um, made it too political. He hasn't named uh, Russia or Ukraine in his speeches. That's caused controversy, but it yeah. does at the same time leave, leave a path of dialogue open for for, uh, mm -hmm. for for dialogue and, and mediation, so um, so he's he's in a very tight spot. But I think they are they are concerned yeah. about Patriarch Kirill's uh, position. That's that's for sure. Phil, your reaction? It, the Pope is in a tight spot, and I think I agree with that. He's trying to walk that tight rope. Hmm. Phil, before I end, a big story getting very little attention. The Diocese of Camden, New Jersey, agreeing to pay $87.5 million this week in one of the biggest sex abuse settlements ever. Now, this came after New Jersey extended the statute of limitations for uh, victims. What's the takeaway here, and do you expect more of these mega settlements from dioceses? The settlements just keep coming, and honestly, the numbers don't make too much of an impression anymore. We're already well over $3 billion, $4 billion in total had, that has been spent on the legal settlements and legal fees associated with sex abuse scandal. It's just going to keep coming. Wow. We will leave it there, gentlemen. Uh, I thank you so much for your time. The indispensable reporting of the National Catholic Register's Ed Penton can be found on their website, and Ed is on Twitter at Edward Penton. And Phil Lawler's reporting and commentary is always at catholicculture.org. Thank you both. My next guest is an Emmy Award-nominated actress and producer. She starred as Monica, of course, in the incredibly popular smash hit, Touched by an Angel. Along with her husband, Mark Burnett, she's responsible for inspirational fare, like the hit miniseries The Bible, films like Son of God and Little Boy. She's also the author of a brand new book, Unexpected Blessings, 90 Inspirations to Nourish Your Soul and Open Your Heart. Here to tell us about it and the power of gratitude, please welcome back to the program our pal Roma Downey. Hi, Roma. Uh, delighted to see you. Each daily devotion in this book starts with a quote, a piece of scripture, and a personal story. Why did you choose that format? And where did the inspiration for this book originate? Well, the inspiration for the book, Raymond, really came from my last book, which was called Box of Butterflies, which was a spiritual yeah. memoir I wrote a couple of years ago. And the subtitle of that book was Discovering the Unexpected Blessings All Around Us. And right. for this new book, I decided to take a deeper dive into those unexpected blessings. And I find that the more I was able to uncover them and identify them and be grateful for them, the more there seemed to be. And I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking mm -hmm. about really taking time to be quiet and still, maybe to go outside and experience nature, to spend more time with family mm -hmm. and friends. You know, I think all of us were forced over the last few years to slow down because of COVID right. and the uncertainty and the confusion that it brought up for many people, particularly at the beginning. And, um, yeah. and yet within that, you know, for those of us that were fortunate enough not to get terribly sick with COVID, we found ourselves just with a little bit more time on our hands. And, mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I just found that to be an incredible blessing. I seem to mm -hmm. run at a million miles an hour, working so hard. And, um, and I was so appreciative of just being able to take some time in nature, take some time to, mm -hmm. to pray, take the time to listen to God, you know, to be still and know that he is God, one of my favorite Psalms. Yeah. And, and I chose to write this in a way that was manageable, you know, that it's 
that is sort of like bite-sized for people. Right. They could join me in the morning, wouldn't take that long, five or 10 minutes, and we could read through this together and end in a prayer together. And it just kind of sets yourself up for success in the day. Yeah. Uh, Roma, talk to me about that. You mentioned it there, how the, the pandemic really uh, affected your life and all of our lives. Talk to me about the strength of stillness. It's a theme you sound in the book, but I know it's a big theme also in your life, light workers vertical, um, stillness, quiet, and that we don't practice it enough. Yes. Well, we, we certainly live in a very noisy world, Raymond, you know, and I know, filled with yeah. distractions. You know, if it's the TV mm -hmm. or it's the laptop or it's your phone or you're on social media, oh, you've <laughs> got an Instagram, you want to send out a tweet. You know, it's on and on and on. And, yeah. um, and I think that one of the blessings for me and for my family that came out of this last few years was just turning everything off for a little bit and, mm -hmm. uh, and really experiencing the joy that comes from being quiet. Um, you know, we think we'd love to hear God, you know, but we, sometimes we're just too noisy to hear him. Yeah. You know, it was a gift. It was a gift for it us. It was like an extended there, retreat, poem, really. Ray, Raymond, there's a poem that I quote in the book, a Mary mm -hmm. Oliver poem, and I really love her work. But she says right. something like, someone once gave me a box of darkness and it's taken mm. me till now to realize that this too was a gift. And I mm. think maybe it's just the older I get. You know, I've, 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 I've had a lot of experience with loss and grief. A lot of people that I loved, unfortunately, have died. And not mm. that I wouldn't give anything to have them back again, but I'm really beginning to understand that even in the loss, there's a blessing. You know, that even yeah. in the pain, when pain can be turned into purpose, you know, one of our goals mm -hmm. at Lightworkers, we are the faith and family division of MGM Studios. And mm -hmm. one of our goals is always to create content and tell stories that uplift and inspire and remind people that they're not alone, remind people yeah. that we belong yeah. to each other. And so I've tried to address some of these themes in this book as well. Yeah, no, I, I love, uh, you know, you write about the loss of your mother, uh, which we've talked about before, and the unexpected blessing, I mean, you lost her at a young age, but the unexpected blessing that can be found in those dark moments, and you're right, and I want to put this up on the screen, wherever you're at, I urge you to fix your eyes not on your circumstances, but on Jesus. At some point, all of us face the dark cocoon of pain. We may long to escape, but we must also remember that our struggle in the hands of God has purpose. In this way, pain becomes an unexpected blessing. It makes us strong enough to fly. Um, I, I, I want to talk about the images we're seeing today of those Ukrainians suffering during this horrible invasion of their country. It's gut-wrenching gut to watch it, uh, emotionally draining at times. And we've been covering this story and praying about it on our show. In your book, you offer advice to how to cope with that frightening news of the world. What is your advice to people, Roma? What should they be doing in the midst of all these troubles? Well, you know, I'm a big believer in prayer, Raymond. I've never made a decision in my life, my personal life or my business life, a decision big or small that I didn't pray about first. And um, mm -hmm. I think it really, it really helps give you clarity and it really helps gives you peace you know, the peace that passes all understanding. So I think that's a very important um, part of this. Um, I have loved the butterfly image for so long. It's such a strong metaphor, isn't it, for, um, for change, for breakthrough, and remembering that it's the very struggle for that butterfly coming out of the cocoon. If we were just to slip that little cocoon, rip it open and help that butterfly out, it would not be able to fly. The wings would be soggy because it is the struggle. It's the forcing mm. of the fluid through the wings that gives the butterfly the strength that it needs to fly. And so too with us, you know, as we go mm. through a variety of struggles in our life. I mean, my mother died at 10. Nothing could have prepared mm. me for her death. It was as if no. the light was turned out. And yet, 15 years later, when I was offered the role of Monica the angel on Touched by an Angel, the very qualities that I needed 
were those that I had learned through that struggle, empathy, compassion, kindness, mm. understanding. These were the qualities that Monica needed. And it was almost as if God had prepared me for that by the life that I was living. So um, mm. we don't always see it when we're in it. You know, my yeah. heart breaks too for the people in this war. I myself grew up in a, in a war and I know how scary yeah. that can be. I grew up in Northern Ireland and, you know, we hid behind cars when gun battles blew, blew out and mm. we ran from buildings that exploded. And it's, it's terrifying, you know, and you just mm. got to hold the people you love close and keep your eyes on God. Yeah. I want to talk about your beloved co-star, your friend, Della Reese uh, from Touched by an Angel, who was really like a mother to you. And you write about, uh, and, and it's one of the things I love about this book, it, 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 of course, embraces the universal, what we all go through, but you make it very personal through your own life, and you, you tell intimate stories. And you write here about that first encounter with Della in, a, in the makeup trailer during the pilot of the show. And you said, I was awed and slightly intimidated at first, so I approached her quietly, politely, reaching out my hand and saying, I just wanted to introduce myself. Oh, baby, I don't show, shake hands. I hug, Della smiled. And she wrapped <laughs> me in the biggest, most loving embrace I'd ever experienced. I immediately felt comfortable and at ease, and in some ways, Della and I were an unlikely duo, a brassy and bold black singer from downtown Detroit and a small, soft-spoken white woman from Ireland. Yet our strong faith formed a deeper bond than any difference could separate us. We loved and strengthened one another for decades, not merely on air, but in everyday life as well. How important was Della in your life, and what did she teach you about gratitude, Yona? Della was uh, really important in my life. You know, I'm sure since my mom died, I had been looking for a mother figure, and I certainly found her in Della Reese. Um, she was like no one else in this world. And, um, you know, and it's true. She, you know, I, I, I laugh remembering my, my attempt at politely shaking hands, and she just wrapped me in a bear hug, you know, and <laughs> man, could she hug. It was great. While we were working together, Raymond, unfortunately, Della's only daughter died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. and, and she came to me and she said, you know, baby, I always knew that God brought me into your life because you needed a mother. She said, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize that he was bringing you into my life because I was going to need a daughter. She said, will mm. you be my baby girl? I said, yeah. And she said, then I mm. am your mom. And she was mm. my mom. And, and you write in the book about uh, how that taught you about the power of presence when she lost her daughter, that at times our presence is all that's needed. And God yeah. puts us in those places when we're most needed. That's right. What do you hope readers well, take away from the book? I didn't know what I was going to say to her. You know, it's like there are no words, right? I mean, if you consider mm. in the English language, there isn't even a word to describe to describe a parent that's lost a child. A child that's lost a parent, we can call orphan. We have widow, mm -hmm. widower, but we don't have a word to describe a parent who's lost a child. I guess maybe just that mm -hmm. word is heartbroken. But she, yeah, um, yeah she did. She taught, she taught all of us so much. You know, she was constantly, her life was a lesson and she was very generous mm -hmm. in sharing that with all of us. So. No question, many, many times she was the unexpected blessing in my life, yeah. and I'm sure I speak for many yeah. when I say that. Roma, what do you hope readers take away from this new book and the intimacy of it? As I share these intimate and very personal stories of my own life and the lessons that I have learned from them, hoping perhaps that the reader you know, will resonate with some of those or will be reminded of something from their own life. Um, and in a way, just to, to start to see that the blessings are everywhere, you know? And in my experience, the more you're grateful for the little things, the more little things show up to be grateful for. Yeah. And I'm convinced that when the heart opens, the Holy Spirit is able to get in. And, you know, once mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit gets in, then God <laughs> does the rest. I feel like my job is just it does to... Indeed. It, it does indeed. 
Roma Downey, happy Easter. Thank you for the gift of this book, and we'll talk again soon. Uh, the book is Unexpected Blessings, 90 Inspirations to Nourish Your Soul and Open Your Heart by Roma Downey. Yeah. It's available at bookstores everywhere and online. Blessings to you, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Raymond. And I'd just like to add briefly that it will make a beautiful yes. Mother's Day gift for anyone out there that's looking for a gift for their mom. Absolutely. And anyone in your life. Thank you, Roma. Talk soon. Thanks, Raymond. Bye. The plight of Hong Kong's Christians under President Xi is getting worse by the day. What exactly is happening to Chinese Catholics and clergy, particularly in Hong Kong? Tonight, we're joined in an exclusive by a priest of the Diocese of Hong Kong who'll speak for the first time under his own name about the persecution of his people and the church at the hands of the communist Chinese regime. Please welcome priest and canonist Father Vincent Wu, joined by director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, Nina Shea. Nina, thank you both for being here. I want to start with you. In a recent uh, National Review piece, uh, China Now Threatens Religious Freedom in Hong Kong, uh, you write about how China now has its sights on a city that's had traditionally been independent of communist control, but no longer. You describe a meeting late last year between Hong Kong's bishops and priests and the Catholic Patriotic Association. What was the outcome of that meeting, and how is it affecting what's happening there now? Well, Raymond, the meeting was to indoctrinate the Hong Kong priests. It was the first step. To, about cynicization. This is the political mm -hmm. ideology and strategy to absorb the Catholic Church and other uh, houses of worship, other Christian churches, into the United Front Work Department of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. And this means that their leadership is on notice that they're going to have to start surveilling their congregations, their flock, um, indoctrinating them and ensuring conformity. Conformity not in Christian doctrine, but in uh, Communist Party dogma. And they're, they're, for example, on the mainland today, uh, under these regulations of cynicization, um, they have to in center their, their, their homilies, their sermons, around President Xi's sayings. Um, they mm. are not only required to do not to do things like not to talk about forbidden topics or to uh, and to ban all children in violation of Jesus's teachings, I might add, uh, from churches mm. and any exposure to religion. But they're supposed to show fervor for the party. They're supposed to now show love for the party, and that's what President Xi uh, emphasized in December when he uh, admonished his uh, cadres to double down on this horrible. Uh, repressive system of cynicization. So this, no, no, is what, so this is what's going on in mainland China, and this is what the Hong Kong priests were being told. Hmm. Father, uh, as Nina's mentioning, this cynicization, uh, which is essentially re-education. The churches, uh, in, the, in the words of the communist uh, government in China, to get their minds right and incorporate the ideals of the Communist Party into religious practice. Uh, Father Vincent, first of all, very brave of you to come here, and we're, we're grateful that well, you are raising me. your voice. Mm -hmm. Well, I know this is the first time you've spoken publicly in your own name about what's happening uh, to your church in Hong Kong. Uh, as a priest of the Hong Kong Diocese, what have you observed about the influence of the party over the, over the church in the last few years, particularly in the wake of that infamous China-Vatican agreement that we heard so much about? Well, I would say with the complete elimination of freedom of speech and press and assembly, uh, freedom, religious freedom will be the next target in Hong Kong because the CCP wants to control everything in, in the society. Just three weeks ago, there was a Protestant pastor in Hong Kong. He was arrested for some comments that he made on his YouTube channel. So that's a complete, mm -hmm. uh, that's a complete violation of free speech, right? So he was arrested for, for saying something against the government. So we foresee that, you know, priests and bishops, we are called to be prophets. We are called to speak out against injustices in the society. But that, you know, that example of the Protestant pastor show priests officials in Hong Kong that if you preach something against the government, there will be tremendous consequences. Because of that, in the past two years, you rarely see any priests and bishops in Hong Kong that will say anything publicly against the Hong Kong government or the CCP. 
Wow. Um, it, it, tell us about this process of sinicization. I think a lot of viewers don't quite understand what that means. I mean, this is really uh, policing, if you will, homilies, uh, twisting the gospel and the Bible to accommodate the political regime of the moment. What form does that take for priests? So the CCP wants to confuse the two ideas, the, the, uh, enculturation and sinicization, right? They want to make people think that, you know, this is actually just enculturation, right? Chinese music mm -hmm. in mass or being dressed in Chinese, but this is not there. This is sinicization is basically conformity of the gospel teaching, Christian teachings into socialist doctrine, into the socialist mm -hmm. agenda. So anything, uh, anything in the Bible, anything in the Christian teaching that is not in conformity with the socialist teaching would have to be cast out so that so mm. that all the teachings will be in, in conformity with the CCP party line. Father Vincent, the, in mainland China, the CCP has been requiring the registration of Catholic priests, Christian pastors, really for some time now. Explain to the audience why they're being registered on the mainland and what could be the implication should priests and pastors be forced to register with the CCP in Hong Kong? It would be good to call into mind the hero example of Cardinal Keung, Bishop of Shanghai mm -hmm. back in the 1950s. He refused to register with the government. He refused to join the Patriotic Association because he knew that if he does that, he is actually placing supremacy of CCP over the church, placing supremacy of communist doctrine over church teaching. For that reason, he and his priests mm. in Shanghai refused to do that. The consequence was that he was jailed for 33 years in Chinese prison. Mm. So, you know, for that case, underground priests and bishops refused to do that because they know that by doing that, they're actually going against church teaching. They're going against their own conscience. So, so, mm. so that's, that's really, that's, you, know, you also have to know that being registered civilly is, is, not, is not just signing a piece of paper. When you mm. register, you are enrolled in the, in the system, meaning that, you know, the government would issue a license to preach, to perform public ministry. But if, mm. in order for you to renew your license, you have to fulfill certain, certain criteria, for example, attending some indoctrination classes or re-education sessions. Or if you preach something against the government, something, some homily that, you know, the, the, that the government doesn't like, they could potentially revoke your, or suspend your license any time. So by being civilly registered, you, they actually really restrict religious freedom in that sense. Wow. So really what we're talking about, just for the clarity of those who may be new to what's happening in China, what, what we're really talking about is a redoctrinization using the, uh, the church and the platform of the church to indoctrinate the people into socialist and communist ideas and barring anyone under 18 from even entering that church. So it becomes another platform of the CCP. That's really what they've established here. Okay. And the Vatican has uh, tacitly or I I implicitly uh, blessed. Yeah, um, Raymond, if I could address that, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the concept of individual or human dignity is anathema to the Communist Party of China. Um, when, when President Xi ordered the crackdown on the Uyghur Muslims, which our government in the United mm -hmm. States has declared a genocide, he said, show no mercy. Now, mercy is fundamental mm -hmm. to Christian doctrine and sh Christian values. Right. Um, as is individual dignity, and uh, this is very. This is really gets to the heart of what's at play. And um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the Vatican um, actually signed the agreement just a few months before the same year, several months before the sinicization policy went. Uh, uh, he, they signed it a few months after the sinicization policy went into effect. And so um, it's, they have, uh, by make, keeping it secret as well, um, the, the Communist Party is able to uh, go to the Chinese Christians and say, this is what's in it to the Catholics, this is what's in it, this is what the Pope wants you to do. Um, and mm -hmm. um, those who refuse are being arrested, like Cardinal Kung was. Um, they're not put on trials. The leadership, the, they're by my count, six bishops now who are in black jails, um, two of them mm. just this year, um, because they refuse to register. Uh, black jails are secret uh, locations, could be a windowless basement somewhere, could be a police station. 
and they are given no due process, no lawyers, no mm. sentencing, just indefinitely held and subject to brainwashing sessions, Maoist struggle sessions, until they agree to uh, either leave their ministry, as one bishop had to in Mingdong, and uh, diocese, and uh, or else uh, stay there indefinitely, or a revolving door in and out, like several of the bishops. Father, uh, give us your insight on the underground Catholic Church. I know for many, many years, the underground Catholic Church was very vibrant. Um, they, they met in secret. Uh, they, they, they kept loyalty to Rome. Uh, and it existed alongside this state-run uh, communist Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association. It, it, does the underground church really exist any longer in light of the Vatican agreement with China? The thing is that most of the underground bishops, they are either jail or they are very old. And we haven't seen any new, old, new underground bishops in the past few years. So the thing is, when these current underground bishops, when they all pass away and return he to heaven, there will be no bishops for the underground church. And if there's no bishop, there's no priest. So in the long run, the mm -hmm. underground church will not be able to sustain because of the lack of bishops and priests. That's a huge problem wow. that we are facing. Father Vincent Wu, I'm interested, how is the Vatican-Chinese agreement viewed by the faithful in China? Are they heartbroken by this agreement? Are they cheered by it? What was, what was the reaction initially, and what is it today among the faithful and clergy? I would say for the underground Catholics, they are very, very disappointed. They, they feel so betrayed, right? And, and for Hong Kong Catholics as well, especially those younger Catholics who, have, who, who really understand the evil of the CCP, they, they're very, very disappointed by, by, by this deal. They're very disappointed. You know, mm. Raymond, Cardinal Zen was very critical of it. He said it would be the death of the underground. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I fear that he's, he's going to be right for the reasons Father Vincent Wu just said. Um, and uh, uh, Cardinal Zen has been silenced himself with a, um, Beijing's propaganda newspaper threatening him, blaming him earlier this year mm -hmm. for creating uh, protests and riots when he was critical of the national security law coming to Hong Kong, right. for example. Uh, and so there is now no one in that political space free to, um, to speak out on his behalf. Um, and that's why I think um, Father Wu's voice is so important. He is is willing to do that, and um, uh, you know the, the, he's a little less um, threatened than they are. But it's China has a long arm, and um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a very courageous thing what he's doing today on your show. Yeah. And um, I agree. Uh, but but this is you know the Vatican said that they uh, have had six ordinations to justify this agreement with Beijing. But again, by my count, there are six bishops now in uh, black jails or under house arrest. Um, and um, so it's, it's uh, you know, it's a net, a net zero. And it's a wash. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a wash. wash. And, and, and I, I'm glad you bring up Cardinal Joseph Zen, of course, a heroic voice, a prophetic mm -hmm. voice for many years, not only on this program, but around the world, mm -hmm. uh, speaking for this persecuted uh, Catholic and Christian community in, in uh, China, yearning for their freedom. Father, what is the current state of Catholic and Christian independent schools in Hong Kong? Have they been suppressed, as is the case on the mainland? So in Hong Kong, 60% of all the schools are actually run by Christians, Catholics and Protestants. The schools are still running, but then the plan of the government is to impose national security law education in each of the schools from kindergarten mm. through colleges. What does it entail? It's basically an Orwellian communist agenda being taught in schools. Just imagine if you're a Catholic school teacher, wow. if, you, if you say that communism is evil, socialism is bad, you could be potentially reported by your students and you could be arrested and jailed for, you know, saying something against the inciting hatred against the CCP. So for this reason, 5,000 school teachers in Hong Kong resigned last year. In one school, Catholic school in Hong Kong, one fifth of all the teachers resigned fairly recently. So teachers really know that, you know, they, they just cannot teach something against their conscience. So that's why they quit the job. Wow. 
No, no, this is this is terrifying because what it really is about. And again, the Chinese brilliantly play the long game. They're worried about the next generation and the next generation, exactly. and uh, and they use their totalitarian means and authoritarian means to 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 strangle all dissent and to impose their viewpoints across the the, the uh, country and beyond and far beyond. Uh, Father, uh, we talked about Cardinal Zan a moment ago. Um, uh, what does his voice mean to you and to the people of Hong Kong? I was a student of Cardinal Zan when I was in the seminary. He taught mm -hmm. me philosophy. You know, he is just a courageous mm -hmm. uh, voice, you know, for democracy, for freedom, um, for the Catholic faith, right? So, so he inspired, you know, many, many young people, young priests, uh, young religious, you know, in the sense that, you know, in the face of persecution, in the face of oppression, we have to resist. We cannot mm. cave in. We have to fight to the end. We have to f we have to fight to the day we die. I mean, that's. I mm. think that he really got that from Cardinal Cohn because Cardinal Zen was actually a student of yes. Cardinal Cohn when when he Cardinal lived in Shanghai. Kuhn, yeah. So I think he really got yes. that from the Shanghai Catholic uh, priest and bishop back in the fifties, and really show you know really mm. taught mm. Hong Kong Catholics how uh, we should live our faith under persecution. Yeah. Well, and you're carrying that, that torch forward, and it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, that, that a, a native-born Chinese carry that message of hope and that message of, of freedom. And uh, you're doing that today. Is there still hope for what um, the, the Vatican strategy here of dialoguing with the Chinese government? I mean, you're dealing with an openly hostile regime. Is dialogue yes. even possible, Father? Well, I would, what I would say is the CCP is notorious for breaking international treaty. You know, the most famous one that he, that he broke was, was the Sino-British Declaration that they signed in 1984, in which they promised Hong Kong 50 years of autonomy. But now mm -hmm. only 25 years are gone. Basically, all freedom in Hong Kong were extinguished, right? So, so I really pray that the Holy Father would take that into account, knowing that he's actually dialoguing with a regime that is not that is notorious for breaking its promises. Yeah. Nina, you mentioned uh, six bishops by your count uh, who have been uh, escorted away, wished away to these black sites. Uh, two of these unsanctioned Catholic bishops were taken away uh, just before Easter. What do we know of their status? And how long can this go on? I guess the Chinese just think they can bully everyone into compliance, and they'll just round up anyone who dares defy them. Well, that's right. I mean, they can't put all the Christians in uh, concentration camps like they did with the Muslims in, in Xinjiang, the Uyghur Muslims, because there's just too many Christians. There's a, a hundred, estimated to be maybe up to 100 million of them in China. Mm. Um, so they're going strategically, surgically after the leadership. And with the Catholics, they don't put them on show trials. They haven't yet, like they did with Cardinal Kung back in the day. Right. They instead are just disappearing them. Father, the lay Catholic businessman and media mogul, uh, uh, really, and freedom fighter, Jimmy Lai, mm -hmm. is still being imprisoned by the communist Chinese. Yes. His yes. lawyers are asking the U.N. to step in and investigate his imprisonment. Mm -hmm. They're calling it legal harassment. Mm -hmm. He, like Cardinal Zen, is under the thumb of this national security law. Yes. Tell us how Jimmy Lai, who was a huge media mogul, what does he mean to other Hong Kong Catholics, and what is he teaching the faithful that the that perhaps they're not seeing from other parliaments. Yes, he is an inspiration to, you know, to Hong Kong Catholics in the sense that, you know, he really could have left Hong Kong and enjoy mm -hmm. his vacation in Paris or in Tokyo, right. but he'd stay to the end. Why? Because he, he wants to be, he wants to suffer with all the protesters who were jailed, who are currently in jail in Hong Kong. He wants to you know, he wants, that's an act of solidarity with those who are suffering. So he willingly mm -hmm. take up the cross like Jesus did. So he's an mm. inspiration to many. And, and I'm sure that he is inspired by his Catholic faith. He, yeah. the, the idea of suffering, you know, the value of suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the season to certainly recall all of that. Nina, before we run out of time, we only have a minute here. Uh, May 24th is the feast day of Our Lady Help of Christians. Pope Benedict dedicated that day to pray for the church in China. Pope Francis has supported this as well. You're working on a lay prayer campaign that week. Tell us about it. 
Yeah, so we want everyone to go to their website and um, Google uh, or, or log in uh, uh, globalprayerforchina.org. And there's a lot of resources that explains uh, what this is all about. But we're hoping for lay and uh, others are welcome to uh, initiatives. Um, if priests or bishops want to take it up, please do. Um, to mm -hmm. initiate prayer for the church in China and for others in China who really need the prayers mm -hmm. right now. Um, and uh, so there is uh, the, the prayer of Our Lady of Shishan's on the website. There's background information, more information about Cardinal Zen and Jimmy Lai and many mm -hmm. others. And, and to uh, explain what is happening, the threat now to Hong Kong, which has had religious freedom up until recently and has right. been uh, free. Um, and now they're coming, being swallowed up by this uh, uh, just horrific, monstrous um, machine that's known as the Chinese mm. Communist Party. So, uh, yes, yeah. the day is May 24th, but from the week of May 22nd to 29th, we're, we're asking okay. for prayer. Father, I want to give you the last word. Sure. Are you at all worried about speaking out? I mean, this is your first time publicly and on, yes. on media uh, speaking out, uh, using your name. Are you concerned about your own safety? And what do you want to say to the suffering Catholics and Christians in Hong Kong right now and around the world? Well, I guess I'm the only person in my diocese who, who is actually able to do something at this moment. Raymond, if you, if you call any parish in Hong Kong and ask you know, to interview any, any priest, I'm sure no one would dare to pick up your phone call because no. it's, it's just dangerous. So I just feel I, I need to do that. I mean, you know, when I die, when I face God's judgment, I would have to answer to God, why I did not speak out in April 2022 for those who mm. are voiceless. I mean, when I think about that, I just, I have no choice. I have to do it because, you know, that's something mm. I'm the only person who, who, who can do at this moment. And I have to be responsible for my omission if, if, if I do not do that today. Well, God bless you, Father Vincent Wu. Uh, our prayers are with you and all the faithful in China. I hope you'll come back to the show. Um, Nina, uh, thank you always for your advocacy and your thank amazing you. work. Uh, thank you both for being here. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. China's zero COVID policy lockdowns in Shanghai have been draconian, to say the least. What are the humanitarian costs of these protocols? And is it realistic to aim for zero cases of COVID at this point. Joining me to discuss this and much more, president of the Population Research Institute, author of Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Steve, let's begin with China's zero COVID strategy. It's total lockdown in Shanghai. It's being reported this week that children are wearing hazmat suits on their way to school. The elderly are basically locked in their homes. Uh, food shortages are looming uh, or already being felt. What has been going on there for five weeks? Uh, it, it's really mind-boggling. Shanghai is a city of 26 million people. How much longer can this feasibly go on? Well, I, I think it will go on until the uh, Chinese Communist Party leader, Xi Jinping, has a lock on a third term as president of China. Mm. Because what this is all about, Raymond, is politics. That's its first, last, and always about politics. It has nothing to do with epidemiology. I mean, every person on the planet recognizes that we're simply going to have to live with coronavirus from now on in the same way that we've lived with the seasonal flu. I mean, even countries that clung to China's mass containment model back in 2021, like Australia, Germany, New Zealand, they're now abandoning it. China is the only, the Lone Ranger out here still trying to impose COVID zero. So it makes no sense mm -hmm. in medical terms. And uh, it makes no sense, obviously, in economic terms, because we've got right. 500 container vessels outside of the port of Shanghai. We've got uh, the Chinese uh, GDP will take a 1% hit this year because of the lockdown in Shanghai and the lockdown in other cities. So when I say it's politics, mm -hmm. what I mean is this. I mean that Xi Jinping wants to be president for life. He wants to be the new Red Emperor taking over Chairman Mao's position. And he will do anything to continue to hold power in China. His main opposition, Raymond, is based in Shanghai. It's called the Shanghai clique. Uh, these are the people who ran mm -hmm. China in the 1990s and the early years of this century. People like mm -hmm. Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji, who's actually spoken out, the, the former president, the former premier, who's actually spoken out against a third term, a third five-year term for Xi Jinping. Guess what? Uh, the mm -hmm. power base of the people who oppose Xi Jinping is now locked down tight. 
local officials are being punished for not enforcing the lockdown. What is that doing? Mm. It's sending a message to the Chinese people, not just in Shanghai, but all over the country, that Xi Jinping is in charge and he's going to be in charge for a long, long time. That's what's going on in wow. politics all the time, every day. Now, in the footage we're seeing out of Shanghai and, and all, all over China, it's terrifying. I mean, they're, you know, they're grabbing bags and throwing pets and, and, and belongings yeah. in and dragging people out of their homes, uh, throwing them into these camps. It's simply unbelievable that this goes on in the modern world. But there it is. And worse, we continue to trade with them and support this barbarism. Steve, before I let you go, I have to ask you about this recent controversy over China making inroads into the strategically vital Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Uh, China signed a security pact with the island's prime minister that could end up extending Chinese military power in that region. Now, for the sake of the audience, this is where Guadalcanal is. The U.S. fought here during World War II. What is the impact of this agreement, and how might it affect U.S. foreign policy and world security in the South Pacific? Well, China doesn't have very many foreign overseas bases. It has one in Africa and Djibouti on the Horn of Africa. Uh, it may have another soon in, uh, in Burma. Um, but this brings the Chinese Navy very close to Australia and New Zealand. It brings it about 1,500 miles away from Australia and New Zealand. It gives them a presence in the South Pacific and enables them to project power in that mm -hmm. region of the world. Remember that that Australia has been targeted for the last two years because right. the prime minister of Australia has been saying, we need to investigate the origin of the China virus. China doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want the invest the, that investigation to take place. Uh, it doesn't want to admit it came from the Wuhan lab. And so they're moving into the mm -hmm. South Pacific. And it's a danger for not just the uh, Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, we have Guam in the South Pacific, not very far away. Right. Right. Before we run out of time, I need your take on the current state of the Vatican-China diplomatic agreement. We discussed it a little earlier in the show, the details of which are yeah. still a secret, Steve. Uh, and yet another renewal is pending this September. Since the signing of this agreement in 2018, things have hardly improved for religious freedom as far as uh, Chinese Catholics are concerned. In a recent column, you write that there have been only six ordinations of Catholic bishops in China over the past several years. What's the game being played here, and why doesn't the Vatican protest? Well, what the Vatican was hoping, of course, a couple of years ago was that the 54 MTCs, which need bishops, would be filled under the new Sino-Vatican agreement. That hasn't happened, right? 48 of them still remain empty. The, that, the Catholic Church in China is still without leadership in most of the country. I think that's quite deliberate and it will continue. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the, point, the appointment of bishops is a measure of the success of the Sino-Vatican agreement, I don't see how you can extend it. Not to mention that the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping has said in the last few months that any organization that has foreign ties, any organization that takes direction from overseas, <laughs> is an illegal organization. All religious organizations must support the Chinese Communist Party. They must support socialism, communism, and they must advance the leadership of Xi Jinping. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, and, and what Father uh, Wu told us earlier in the show about what the locals are enduring on the parish level, on the faithful level, is really, it's all terrifying. And the United States and the world should engage or simply not trade with this barbarous regime. I mean, we talk about never forget what's happening before our eyes is, is just as potent and horrible. The human and, and religious rights infringements here. It, it, it's, it's, it, uh, we talk about this every week, Steve. We're exhausted talking about it, but it's going on day after day, minute after minute. We'll leave it there. Bully of Asia by Stephen Mosher is the definitive work on China's plans for global dominance. It's available in bookstores everywhere. You can follow Steve on Twitter. It's Stephen W. Mosher, and thank you for coming out. I know you weren't feeling all that well. You, you, you carried thank through you. like a trooper. Thank you, Stephen. That is thank all the time we have for now. This week marks the 99th birthday of our dear Mother Angelica. Please pray for the repose of Mother's soul, her communities, and for the extension of her mission here at EWTN.
Happy birthday, Reverend Mother. We love you. Be sure to catch us next week when we'll expose the perilous situation facing Christians in Lebanon. No one talks about this. We will. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.